Welcome to Take the Lead Radio. This is Dr. Diane Hamilton, and I'm so glad you joined us. Uh, this is going to be a little special episode because I decided to put together five different um, clips from five different uh, guests I've had on my show that I thought were just some of the more interesting shows for people who want to learn to be speakers. Now, these guys are all best buddies, and they're all Hall of Fame speakers, and they were some of the most fun people to interview. I thoroughly enjoyed it. Uh, we have uh, not only Joe Calloway, but Mark Sanborn, Scott McCain, Lin uh, Larry Wingate, and Randy Pennington are all on this show today. And you can listen to each individual episode of theirs at uh, drdianehamilton.com forward slash um, episodes. So that's drdianehamilton.com forward slash episodes. But the the gist of what they had to say regarding just the speaking part of what they do is what I captured on this particular episode because I thought it would be kind of fun to have them all together in one place. Plus, it's so uh, interesting to hear just how they became these successful Hall of Fame speakers and authors. I mean, they're just so well known. And every time I, you, you talk to one, you go, wow, that guy was so interesting. You talk to the next one, and he, wow, that guy was so interesting. And they were all like that. So I hope that you find them all interesting as I did. I'm sure you will. And hopefully people listening are either, you know, a lot of people listening are either speakers, uh, they wanna be speakers, they wanna communicate better, if you can't get something from learning from these guys, it's not out there because these guys know it all. So I hope you enjoy it and we'll be back right after this. Well, my next speaker and guest is Joe Calloway. And when Joe was on, he was just so uh, fun to talk to because he's just such a happy guy, you know? I mean, he's just, you can tell that he's having a good time and he's just so authentic. Uh, he was so sweet after the show. We had not met, and uh, within a few minutes of doing the show, he sent me back a really wonderful YouTube video that you can, if you look up Dr. Diane Hamilton and Joe Calloway on YouTube, you can see what he created as a testimonial for my show. And I, I, that's why he gets to go first <laughs> on the list, because he was nice enough to do that. But he was such a wonderful guest, and I thoroughly enjoyed everything that he had to say. So um, I just took a few clips from what he had uh, based on the speaking and experience he'd had. And um, I want you to just listen to some of the highlights from that conversation with Joe Calloway. Oh, I'm so happy to be here. I Listen, I wouldn't be anywhere else right now. <laughs> Well, I like your enthusiasm, and, and we had a chance to chat a little before the, the show started here, and we've had a few of your friends on the show, and it's been a lot of fun talking to Scott McCain and and uh, Larry Wing. It just, oh, I mean, you've got a group of, of guys that are just amazing. But um, I tell you, they're, they're smart, they're interesting, and the best part of all is they're nice guys. <laughs> they really are, and I, I've enjoyed chatting with all of you. Uh, Right. You know, I, I mean, I, I see a lot of speakers because I go to a lot of events and I you, you listen to them and they, there's not really anything that they're saying that is so unique. It's it's, it's how much they motivate you to want to take action. Yeah. Don't you think? I mean, it's that more than anything. I, I do. And, and, you know, I had a CEO say something to me that I loved. It was after he it's funny, he spoke to his five hundred top managers leadership team and then I spoke to him. Mm -hmm. And after it was over, he said, You know, that just beats all. He <laughs> said, You pretty much said the same thing to him that I've been saying for five years. Uh -huh. But when you said it, they they all start going, Oh, okay, I get it. And when do you think the difference was? I think the difference is number one, I'm it it, it always you, 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 when you're an outsider, it's the old thing as an expert is somebody from more than 50 miles out of town. When you're an <laughs> outsider, and, and I also bring uh, an outside perspective. Um, you know what? The, the way I speak, Diane, is it kind of follows a pattern. I'll make a point, mm -hmm. and then I'll try and cite a source, or I'll quote. I'll say, you know, Steve Jobs talked about this when he said... And then I paint a picture. I tell a story and I say, here's what it looks like. And that's when the light bulb goes on. Right. When they go, oh my gosh, you know, I, I've heard this, but this now it makes sense to me. Now I see how I can use this. 
And that's really what I think my job is, is to take these ideas, and they always evolve because everything changes all the time, but take these ideas and make them useful to people. Well, and you also have a cute sense of humor, and all you, you, all of you guys in your group that I've interviewed have all got that. And I, I was, you know, laughing when I was watching your your talks about how with Zappos, you know, you hit send and the doorbell rings. I mean, you you make <laughs> yeah. you, you make a comment in a way that it, it is a visual. You know, someone else could just say, you know, the instant service. I mean, it just depends how you say it, right? <laughs> well, it it really does, uh, and you know, it's funny. Uh, it, Sometimes uh, Scott McCain and Larry Wingett and Mark Sanborn, we, we'll all be at the same event. Right. And when when one of us is on stage mm-hmm. and the rest of us are in the back of the room, we just look at each other and shake our heads and go, golly, he's good. <laughs> uh, well, you are all good. I mean, Mark was one of the first on my show. You guys are just amazing. And it's just fun to... Um, just as a speaker, I, I learn so much every time I watch any of you, you guys, uh, your videos and your talks, and I haven't seen any of you live. I want to, <laughs> but I'm, I'm very anxious uh, to do that. And I, what I think is that you guys have this real um, relaxed kind of a, you know, obvious, you obviously have done this a million times and you can tell, you know, I mean, it's very, it comes across that way. But I, I think it was uh, Scott that said he, he took, uh, he did the first hundred speeches for free or something to that effect. Did you have to do that as well? You know, I did a bunch of them for free, and I did a bunch. I, listen, my first paid speech, I will never forget it. Yeah. I spoke on a Saturday morning at 10 o'clock to about 50 women at a Weight Watchers. <laughs> they had hired me to talk about the power of goal setting. Huh. And they were the most wonderful people in the greatest audience, and they gave oh, me good. a check for fifty. For, they gave me a check for fifty bucks. Wow! And I thought, okay, okay this is it. <laughs> I have cracked the code. <laughs> <laughs> I'm I'm on to something you're, now. You're on your way up. I bet your friends, you guys, can, you know talk to each other and see what what works i'm sure you you've done that with that group i'm, I'm sure larry probably will tell you <laughs> what he thinks right oh yeah and, and we tell we tell him he makes fun he makes larry makes fun of me because i wear armani suits on stage uh-huh. and i make fun of him because i say wing it the last time i wore a costume i was sick <laughs> He wears the cowboy outfit right I, i'm trying to oh he totally does uh-huh. and, and the thing is when we say stuff like that to each other, nobody laughs louder than the one that's getting shot at. Oh, I'll bet. <laughs> Next up was uh, Mark Sanborn, who actually was on the show first, and he was the nicest guy to, to introduce me to his buddies. Within a little while of getting off of uh, the show, he sent an email to all of them and asked them to be on my show, and, and I am uh, very grateful for that. Um, he actually, I think, had a cold, and he was doing really well because he was having a little bit of uh, laryngitis that day, and I, I, I thank him for hanging in there. But uh, everybody knows uh, Mark from his Fred Factor and all of his, his work, and he really had some inspirational things to say on the show. And, and I always like to know, um, you know, how they get to be so, I don't know, these, these guys just have this personality that just shines through. And if you look at at uh, Mark's site. You'll just see it in his uh, sizzle reels and everything else. So take a listen to uh, what Mark had to say. And I, I, I know a lot of people that listening are either leaders or they're uh, speakers or, you know, success coaches and that type of thing. And I'm sure, you know, they, they would love to replicate what you've done to be successful. And, I, you know, what I think is interesting um, is you, your sense of humor comes through so clearly in what you do, which I think is really what makes a, a great speaker. How much, how difficult is it to incorporate a comedy, uh, you know, humor and not fall flat? Well, you know, historically I was not known, especially in the early days, as a particularly funny speaker. I never tried, I never tried to be, and frankly, you know, in retrospect, I probably took myself a bit seriously, mm-hmm. and not, not, not out of any kind of self-absorption, but out of a real commitment to, to, to my craft, you know. Mm-hmm. Uh, I really, I really worked at at being good, not only on stage, but in in talking about things that were were true, you know, that weren't just sensational. 
But what kind of happened, the, the big shift for me was uh, I just started paying attention that, you know, the more fun speakers had, the, the, the better received they were. And that you could give just, you know, an, an extraordinarily content-packed presentation. But if there wasn't some levity and fun and engagement, you know, mm-hmm. people, it's like, wow, people like the funny guy? I don't remember one thing I can do as a result of the funny guy. Well, you know, people remember they had a lot more fun listening to the funny guy than they did the content guy or gal. Uh, but the other thing is, I, I think audiences are a whole lot more forgiving. I think humor uh, has always been important, but I think in these serious times we live in where, you know, third world dictators threaten nuclear annihilation on a regular basis, yeah. wow. I yeah. think that we we really, really want to, to to be able to maintain our balance by by laughing, I'm I'm a I'm a lot more out there. I'm a lot edgier. I probably piss people off. I, I'm sure I do much more now than I did when I started because I, you know, when you're starting out, you can't take a lot of risks. Because that's something I'd say to to speakers: don't don't be a rule breaker until you've learned the rules. Right. Right. Only break a rule when you know it's a rule and you say, you know what, I'm going to break that rule, but you knew it was a rule. If, you, if you're if you a rule breaker but you don't know what the rules are, you're, you're just an anarchist. You know, you're just... You're just winging it, um, and, and so it's, I think. It, I think also it really comes down to as, as simple as it sounds. If you're not having fun on stage, I, your audience isn't either. Yeah, I, you know it's so true because uh, it, I, I've noticed the older I get, the, the more you go. Well, who cares? You know what I mean? This is just going to be what it is, and you don't take yourself so seriously <laughs> as you do when you're younger. I mean, if you could go back and at, to when you were first speaking, do you think you'd change anything you did, or do you think it was what made you so successful now? Well, what I did worked really well back then at the fee I was at and the times that I lived in, and I. I hope, you know, I think that the number one challenge of any communicator, and frankly, it's a challenge for a leader, is to stay relevant so that you don't wake up, you know, resting on material that was really hot in, in 1993, but it's really tired in, in uh, 2017. Uh, that goes back to, you know, getting into those grooves. I'm, I'm always creating material. Uh, I've, I'm as proud of the material I've discarded as I am the material I'm currently using because a lot of what I've discarded would still work, but you know, it just wasn't keep, it wasn't challenging me. It wasn't fresh. And over time, the marketplace, if you don't, if you don't have something new to say, that's truly engaging, then you end up becoming the phone stops ringing. That's why I write books every two to three years is first of all, challenges me to keep learning something right uh and then number two it, it it says to the marketplace you know hey i haven't i haven't been sitting on my hands telling the same old stories for the last you know 30 years well next up is uh, scott mccain and scott is an interesting guy because he had that some of the greatest stories i had a hard time whittling down to figure out what wasn't speech related uh, because I asked him so many things about speaking. So he, he, we got a little bit more information from him because I asked him more questions about speaking in particular, but uh, they all had just great content. And uh, Scott had some good stories about Schwarzenegger and the White House. And you got to listen to his uh, uh, his stories because uh, I thoroughly enjoyed having him on. And boy, does he have the speaker voice. I think uh, I, I think a lot of people would like to have what these guys have in terms of this dynamic personality and and all of them definitely have it. So let's listen to Scott. Well, you know, I have a lot of speakers that listen to the show and they yeah. pro- they're, or they're trying to be. And I, I just wondered what would you, advice would you give them to be a successful speaker? I mean, obviously, you've got the voice, you've got the personality, you've got all that. Well, thank and you. And it, you, it wouldn't even, you know, you could just get up there and just talk and, uh, you know, but you could probably talk about anything. But don't you think that there's a lot of people that have a challenge right at the beginning to develop all that? Oh, gosh, yes. I, I, one of the things that I've realized is the hardest thing in the world is to make it look easy. <laughs> That's a, right? so true. I mean, um, I, I was watching uh, uh, the recent NBA playoffs, and you see LeBron James, and just like Michael Jordan did, you know, mm-hmm. it seems like he's so effortless in his excellence, and he moves so, you know, so easily. Mm-hmm. And we'll go try to do that. Right, uh, right. It, it, it's you know, and, and he's competing against the greatest athletes in the world, and he's still, uh, you know, looking better than they do. And so, 
it's extraordinarily hard. Uh, we we saw Celine Dion here in Las Vegas not long ago, and she it just seemed so effortless. And then friends of ours went the next night, and it was exactly the same show. Mm-hmm. Even the quote unquote ad libs that you right, thought right, were right. ad libs, uh-huh. no, no, they they was exact. And so I, I I think part of what happens is that the best in any industry, um part of how they connect with their audience and part of how they connect and and build their brand is it seems so effortless. It seems so easy. They seem so natural doing it, but in any industry, it's breathtakingly hard to get it to that point where it appears to be so easy and so casual. Mm -hmm. And, and I think that's part of the reason that there's a gulf between, you know, those folks that, that want to achieve in a profession and, and using speaking as the example, and, and the few that do, is that for some folks, they, they don't, the, those that they admire and those that they try to emulate make it seem so easy that it masks the difficulty in, in achieving that degree of excellence. Right. Um, so the biggest advice that I would give um, is, is have a great speech. Unfortunately, I see a lot of folks that say, well, if I just do this on social media, or oh, if I get this great sizzle reel, or oh, if I just do this or do that, and the magic's in the mix. There mm-hmm. is no silver bullet. But but if there's one thing that you could do, it's it's have a killer speech. People don't realize I gave a thousand free speeches before I charged. Anything. Wow, that's a lot. And and so people will come and say, "How do I do what you do?" And my standard answer for a number of years has been, "Look, I gave a thousand free speeches. If you'll go do half that, I, I'll help you in any way that I can." And, and I've mentored folks and I've helped folks, but I have yet to have a single person come back and say, I did 500 free keynote presentations. Well, what do you think is the biggest difference between your first keynote and your 999 <laughs> keynote? <laughs> I mean, you know, your, of your free speeches. What was the difference, do you think? I, oh, gosh, there's, there's too many to list, really. I mean, uh-huh. there's, nothing, there's nothing to beat stage time. I mean, it's the same reason that, uh, you know, no comic starts uh, with with a gig on The Tonight Show or or, or with Stephen Colbert or or whatever. I mean, they work these rotten comedy clubs and these horrible gigs. And, you know, you you polish and perfect your craft. And and it's a combination of things. I mean, one of the things that absolutely fascinates me is that as I'm telling a story, if, if I change one word of that story, or if I move even a word that works up earlier in a sentence, it doesn't have the impact on the audience that it would have when it's done exactly right. Huh. And, That's interesting. and it takes that much effort to polish your material and then to polish your delivery and to feel comfortable on the stage. Mm-hmm. You know, I, I still get performance anxiety. Uh, people say nervous. Well, you know... To me, nervous or fright means it's not controllable. Right. Uh, but I, I still get that anxiety every time before I go out, well, and and that's because yeah. I care. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it's because I care about what I do. I mean, it really, really matters to me to do a good job. A- at the beginning, though, you're just nervous, and I, I think mm-hmm. the difference between being nervous and having performance anxiety is your degree of preparation. Well, you know, I mean, you're in the Speakers Hall of Fame. I mean, tell me what it took to get into the, what is the Professional Speakers Hall of Fame. There's not too many yeah. people in that. How did you, you know, what did that feel like to make it to that level? Oh, I thought, <laughs> holy cow, have I peaked? <laughs> <laughs> it's all downhill from here, right? I just put me out the pasture. <laughs> uh, it, it, it was Kinda an down. incredible honor, and, and uh, I'm, I'm one of the youngest to have ever uh, you know, receive that that recognition. Well, you're in with Zig and, Ziglar, Seth Godin, Dale Carnegie. I mean, wow, that's yeah. a big deal. I mean, it, it was really, really, a, a, it was an honor. I and uh, one of the things that I'll I'll never forget is when I walked up and I started to receive the award. I looked down, and uh, Og Mandino, that wrote uh, "Greatest Salesman in the World" and and uh, one of the you know biggest selling authors of all time. Uh, he was in the front row and was standing up clapping as I as I got the got the oh, award. Wow. And I thought, man, something is backwards here. I, <laughs> I, you know, I, I, I've, I've been in his audience and stood and applauded for him, That's but awesome. for that to happen with me and and uh, it, it was it's just a, an extraordinary privilege. But you know, at the same at the same time, 
um, for those of us, and you've talked to several of us, Mark Sanborn, Ford uh-huh. Sakes, others, mm-hmm. um, I, I think at the same time, part of what we recognize is it's, it's, it's also um, uh, a commitment to the profession uh, to represent yourself in the best way possible and to, um, you know, try to, try to be an example of the standards and the ethics. And, and well, it gets back to what you were talking about earlier, Diane, in terms of you know the, the the discipline and the work and and there there are so many things we're seeing now in so many different industries, not just speaking I mean, in every industry. Mm-hmm. Hey, come to this weekend boot camp, and when you leave, you're going to be an author, or you're going to be a speaker, or you're right, going to be right. a professional. You know, and I I, I figure sometime I'm going to see you come this weekend, or you're a brain surgeon. <laughs> weekend brain surgery boot camp. You know, it's, uh, you're going to and and to 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 attain a standard of excellence requires. Uh, a more substantial commitment than the get rich folks get rich quick folks are are telling us and mm-hmm. and so i think I think those of us that have been fortunate and blessed in this recognition of the Hall of Fame, I, I think it's also incumbent upon us to to undertake the responsibility of of sharing what's what's great about the profession and and trying to share the the importance of the discipline of the profession as well. Well, you know, you, you just you've been booked by so many uh, amazing people. And I saw that Schwarzenegger uh, booked you yeah. for the White House. What was that like? Who? Which president was that? And can you tell me a little bit? Uh, it was pres- yeah, President Bush, mm-hmm. and it was uh, uh, Diana. It was just the most amazing thing in the world. They, I, bet. I walk out. I walk out on this stage, and I look down. And and sitting in the front row is Arnold Schwarzenegger taking notes, <laughs> and it, it, it just blew me away. I it's mean, and so after after the speech, he could not have been nicer, and he said, "Someday we will work together." And I just thought, "Oh, what a you know," he was being nice to me. And never, never in my wildest dreams did I ever think. And uh, so then, out of the blue, I get this call, and he said, "Yeah, I told you we were going to work together. I, I'm I'm in charge of this event at the White House, and I'd like for you to." to give your speech and then to after the speech to MC the the event and the president's going to be in the audience and it's going to be on the lawn of the White House and uh, wow. you know President Bush and his wife and everybody's going to be there and it, it was it was surreal it was absolutely surreal but but it but an extraordinary experience. Were your butterflies a little more intense that day? <laughs> oh, I've, I've got the I got the funniest thing. So, a buddy of mine, one of my best friends from from back when I was a teenager. Uh, was working at the White House, mm-hmm. and uh, he he was on the senior staff of the White House. So I called him and I said, "Fred, here's the deal." And and he'd already heard that I was going to be doing this. We'd made plans to get together, but I said, "Look, well, I, I'm I'm afraid that the setting is going to overwhelm me, right? And, uh, you know, mm-hmm. yeah, it's the White House, right? right? And right. and where the stage was, uh, you know, I'm looking at the White House. The president, and I said, "Is there any way? Because I know they're constructing the set. Is there any way the day before?" that I could just get out there on the White House lawn and walk up on that set and just kind of so I can visualize and walk through it so the next day when it's actually happening, I'm I'm not so overwhelmed by the surroundings. Well, you know, like I said, Fred mm-hmm. was on the senior staff. He could make anything happen. So mm-hmm. the day before, I show up at the White House, and they take me out, and they leave me alone <laughs> on the lawn on the stage. And so I walked up. And I thought in my head, gave my speech, and I walked back. I thought, well, I'll try it again. And I walked back up, and I, you know, I, I think at least in my head, I'm, well, evidently I wasn't just doing it uh, in my head because I hear a voice that says, "Scott, what are you doing?" Oh. And I looked down, <laughs> and Arnold and President and Mrs. Bush are standing there laughing. Oh. Wow. And. Arnold was in the Oval Office, and they were talking about what was going to happen the next day. And oh, the president sorry. says, "Who is this guy alone in the lawn of the White House talking to himself on the stage?" <laughs> and no snipers. Oh, that's my speaker. <laughs> that's my guy. And so they walked out, and uh, it's the most—it's one of my most embarrassing moments. Oh, the way I met was the president of the United States was in saying, "Who is this guy talking to himself?" <laughs> Right. That is so, awesome. Did it were, all after that? Gracious. Did you get to spend any time with them, or was was that? Yeah, uh, yeah, just just, uh, just a little. And then uh, one of the things the president said is, "How in the world did you get out here?" And I yeah. said, "Well, uh, Fred McClure's one of my best friends," and he, and, which you know even made it better. He said, "Oh man, I got to tell Fred about his pal that talks to himself." <laughs> <laughs> 
Well, next up is Larry Wingate, and he had me laughing the whole show because he's just so outspoken. And uh, I really loved talking to him. He actually lives nearby me, and uh, someday maybe we'll meet up. But it, it was just so fun to hear his um, real type of uh, answers to questions. He, there, there's no sugarcoating it with Larry, and, and that made it so much fun. And, you know, he, he gave the, the realistic side with speaking of uh, what it, how, you know, the challenges. It's not all fun and glamour, but uh, he, he definitely has uh, got an appeal to him that has been so successful. And everybody um, agreed that uh, he's, he's the life of the party. So <laughs> up next is Larry Wingate. Well, do you love your job at times or? or... No. <laughs> and does anybody ever say they, they don't like your presentations? How does that make you feel if, if you get a negative review? I mean, does it matter? Or... Uh, reviews? Who looks at reviews? Yeah. So you're just. I don't care anything about reviews. Uh -huh. Chances are I'm not going back anyway. So what difference does it make? <laughs> do you ever but get here's a, back? <laughs> I tell people all the time that I love my time on stage. Mm hmm. I, and I do. I love my time on stage. But if you took all the time I actually spend on stage throughout the course of the year, that might add up to about 75 hours. Right, right. And you've got to travel 200 know, days to make the 75 hours happen. I love the 75 hours. I hate the 200 days of travel and putting up with airlines and rental yeah. cars and all that stuff. But I put up with it in order to do the part that I do love. Mm -hmm. So yeah, there are elements of my job that I enjoy. But I, I did a speech where a guy came up and said, thank you, Larry, for sharing your passion with my people. And I said, you didn't see any passion up there. <laughs> and he said, well, I know you say that stuff, but I can recognize passion. I said, no, you don't recognize excellence. I'm good at my job. Mm -hmm. That's the difference. There's no passion in my job. Mm -hmm. People can be passionately incompetent. <laughs> I am good at my job. And he said, oh, again, you say all that. I said, let me, let me help you with this just a little bit. Speech was done. I didn't care. <laughs> I, I said, here's the deal. I am passionate about sitting on my back patio with my wife sitting next to me, a good cigar in my left hand, a good bourbon in my right hand, my bulldog by my, by my side, listening to Merle Haggard playing in the background as I watch the sun go down over the mountain. That is my passion. Thank you for financing it. <laughs> well, do you think you have to be flamboyant to be a good speaker? Oh, I think you have to be... Now, maybe not flamboyant, but you have to be interesting. Mm -hmm. And, in fact, I think there's only one rule you can't break. You can't be boring. Right. Uh, and we've got a lot of people who think that their content is what's going to uh, keep them busy because their content is so brilliant. Mm -hmm. uh, and then they take the stage and you listen to them and you go, yeah, first of all, your content's not very in uh, brilliant and you're not very interesting. <laughs> But somebody that makes you laugh, somebody that entertains you, we live in an entertainment society. Mm -hmm. You can say anything in the world as long as you keep people interested and entertained while you're doing it, mm -hmm. and they'll put up with it. They'll enjoy it. Do you interact with the millennials, and how does that go over? Uh, not my audience. <laughs> <laughs> You don't get any You know, and, and I've got friends who are in the speaking business who say, in order to stay relevant, you have to figure out a way to appeal to both the millennials and the boomers. Right. I'm not interested in staying relevant. <laughs> I'm not going to change what I have to say in order to make one segment of society happy. Mm -hmm. I'm not going to do it. I say what I have to say. I speak about core values. That's mm -hmm. it. Right. Uh, honesty, integrity, responsibility, work ethic, doing the right thing, treating people right. That's what I speak about. Mm -hmm. That should not be uh, age uh, specific. Everybody should do that. And if millennials have a problem with the fact that I say you're broke because you want to be broke and nobody should take care of you simply because you're not willing to work or find the job of your dreams, do your damn job because you were hired to do it. Uh, if that bothers them, that's going to have to be their problem, not mine. I won't compromise the core values that I speak about in order to make someone happy. Well, last up is Randy Pennington, and I put him last just because he was the last one to do the show. But boy, has his information great. And everything about this guy, is, it's just, he's so 
uh, he was just open and charming. And I don't think that there was one guy on this show that that I didn't ha think, well, no wonder they're all friends because they all had that same, I don't know, you just want to hang out with them attitude. And they were all so fun to talk to after the show. Randy was so sweet. And we chatted for a long time and he gave some great advice to speakers. And I hope that uh, you guys take a listen because he's got some good advice. Well, that, that's so important too, you know, and uh, you, you've got so much that you and all the guys that we talked about earlier, you guys all have such great advice that you share with your clients and you, you're a keynote speaker and Hall of Fame speaker, like I said, and, and I, I was watching some of your videos and I'm, I'm just curious, I, I just always, I'm fascinated by how you get to be so good. And I know I've asked Joe and some of the other ones, you know, about this, how, how do you get to this level? And do you have like a really great um, one event that you attended or something that you saw that just stood out in your mind as something that was just unusual of your speaking events? I know I got, to, Scott told me a little bit about his White House uh, <laughs> Schwarzenegger story. Do you have a, some kind of event that you attended as a speaker that stands out that was a cool thing to share? Well, I want to go back first off. There, there's probably one or two, um, but I want to go back first off to, you know, how do you get good? Mm -hmm. You start off by not being good, and you continue to work every day. Yeah, that's, that's so true. That's how you get good. Uh -huh. um, get, you, you know, you, the, you have to have stage time. You have to practice. You have to be intentional about this. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, I hear speakers say all the time, uh, well, I just stand up on stage and wing it. Uh -huh. Yeah. yeah. No, you don't. I mean, uh -huh. if you go to the dentist, you want your dentist to walk into your exam room and go, I'm just going to wing it today. <laughs> uh, <laughs> I'm going to read about this while I'm doing it. <laughs> right. So, I, yeah, I'm, I'm just going to. So, the first thing is you, you, know, you get really good by being very intentional and you work at it and you work at it and you work at it. Now, to the one that st stands out for me, um, you know, probably the one that stands out for me that I had really the most fun at um, was about a year and a half, well, it was two, but the last one is about a year and a half ago. Uh, I was invited to New Zealand to speak to all the school board elected officials in the country of New Zealand. Hmm. That must have been beautiful. And, and, and it was so cool because... Not just the fact that it was in New Zealand, right. that was nice too, mm -hmm. but but here was a group of people, and, and the topic was culture. Mm -hmm. And what they were trying to figure out is, how do we create a culture of excellence within our communities and, then with, and within our schools, because we realize that the culture of, that we create within our school and our community is uh, has a direct influence on the ability of our children and our children's children to succeed in the world tomorrow. Mm -hmm. And I, and I thought that was so amazing. Yeah. And there was about, you know, like 850, 900 people there and to have 900 people there absolutely focused on and interested in how do we create the culture today that sustains and empowers our children and our children's children tomorrow. Um, you know, it wasn't quite Scott McCain's White House, but it was pretty cool. <laughs> well, I think it sounds pretty cool to me, too. And I, and I think that, you know, you get these inspirational stories of people when you when you go around and you speak and everybody kind of affects you in different ways. And, you know, I, I was reading, uh, I think it was one of your talks I watched that you were talking about that heroes are known by their results. And I'm just, you know, I mean, how do, what, it, it, how do you express the importance of the people delivering results? I mean, when you're in these, I, I think I liked your story about the band with the T-shirts sold. <laughs> right. I mean, <laughs> I mean, I don't know if you want to tell that one or some other one, but about the Well, I mean, yeah, the, I, mean I, was, I was at, I'll tell that story very quickly, Diane. Okay. It was, uh, I was at a concert. It was an outdoor concert, beautiful evening, 20,000 or so people there. And I, you know, I walked in. This was a very well-known band at the time, and uh, I walked in. And the guy said, "I talked to the T-shirt guys. I walked by and said, hey, how he was setting up? How you doing? How's it going?'" He said, "This is going to be great. We're going to sell out. We'll probably sell out all of our shirts within the first half hour. I mean, the, there's, we didn't bring a lot of product. It was in the summer, uh, so we'll, this is going to be a good night." 
And as I'm walking out, he's packing up about half of his product. And and I said, so how was your night? And he said, man, this audience sucks. <laughs> and I said, really? He said, yeah, they didn't buy anything. And I said, so you think it had anything to do with the fact that your lead singer forgot the words to your most popular song uh, and had to start over again? Mm -hmm. Do you think it had anything to do with the fact that he was drunk and cursing and pouring beer on the monitors on the stage because he didn't think the sound was right? Do you think it had anything to do with those things? And he said, no, this audience sucks. <laughs> and, and, and so, you know, first off, that's an accountability issue. Oh, yeah. Uh, that that that's under that's not understanding cause and effect. I mean that's pretty basic. <laughs> right, right. You do a bad show, people don't buy your stuff. You know, for <laughs> business, it's the same thing. You you offer bad service, people don't continue to buy from you. There is a cause and effect that goes with that, and you know you may not like the cause and effect, but people reward and acknowledge results. You know. There is a reason why there is only one best picture. Of it. There may be several nominations, but there's only one person that gets the award, uh, and you know, and and exceeds their time limit and gets played off the stage on the Oscars. Right. Uh, and, and it's because someone wins. Uh, and 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 one of the things I hear about millennials, uh, which I don't necessarily believe, is that everybody has to win. No, mm -hmm. I don't think millennials believe everyone has to win. Mm -hmm. They know that there are winners and losers in the world. Right. But that doesn't mean just because I wasn't first that I did. Well, I have to say that I had the best time just going through these clips, listening to them again, because everyone that had been on my show, you know, sometimes I, I get so many people that I don't really uh, get a chance to re-listen to the shows. And these guys, each one of them, I was laughing and listening and thinking, boy, I would love to hang out with these guys. So maybe someday I will, if they ever invite me, if they have a talk, I would enjoy that. But I uh, really wanted to thank them again for being on the show the first time. And I thought it'd be nice to kind of put them all together in a compilation. So thank you, gentlemen. Thoroughly enjoyed it. And I hope everyone else did. And I hope everybody comes back for the next episode of Take the Lead Radio.